An extra for you after the news is Central Sports Special with the Forest Palace Rumbelow's League Cup quarterfinal. That's at 10.40. Now, the time is 10 o'clock. Blank murder, Ulster's loyalist gunmen kill five more. A priest says, too much horror, too much death. Ashdown admits an affair, his wife says, I'll support him. The break-in that broke the story, coincidence or conspiracy? And Keegan's Newcastle return, they say it's a perfect marriage. Good evening, the scale and ferocity of sectarian murder on the streets of Belfast intensified still further today, Loyalist gunmen shot and killed five men in a betting shop. Ten others were wounded. The illegal Ulster Freedom Fighters said they did it. Ten people have now died in violent shootings in the past two days. The RUC's Chief Constable, Sir Hugh Annesley, called it murder madness. A doctor who helped today's victim said, people are absolutely frozen. They are numb. This was the scene of chaos after two gunmen turned a lunchtime betting session into a bloodbath. Ambulance men saved as many lives as they could. The survivors were overcome by what they had seen. And the walking wounded were in even deeper shock. The seriously injured were still being wheeled out of the bookmakers as more ambulances arrived. This is a Catholic area in the south of Belfast. The loyalist Ulster Freedom Fighters called it a target. Two men, one with a handgun, the other with a rifle, walked into the bookmakers and immediately started shooting indiscriminately. They left behind shock, despair and grief. Because our sons, our husbands, our brothers and all is getting shot there. What for? What's he gaining? Nothing at all. Look at this woman. Look at that woman down there. You know the people who... I do. But pardon? Well, apparently there's a brother of mine and they tell me he's dead. Our brother's dead. Too much horror, blood, death. Too much for any one day. It's... When you got... It's horrific. There. When I got there. They were dying. Four of them died while I was there with them. Only 24 hours after three were killed in another outrage in West Belfast, an even more shocking toll of casualties. Five dead, ten injured. Ever since the IRA bombing near Cookstown, which claimed the lives of eight Protestants just over two weeks ago, there had been fears of a loyalist backlash. The RUC's chief constable arrived at the scene to express his outrage. Once again, I find myself in the situation of having to describe to you what can only be described as murder madness. He denied that the violence here is becoming out of control and vowed that the murder inquiry will be pursued with utter vigor. But church leaders spoke of a new desperation because of the violence. There's no way in which a campaign can be conducted calling itself a military campaign without its degenerating into what we've had these days, which is simply sectarian gang shootouts a kind of murder mania. Tonight, the father of the youngest victim of today's shootings, 15-year-old James Kennedy, spoke of his son's death. It wasn't his fault, was it, that he got shot? He didn't help the escalate. I didn't help the escalate. It's only innocent people who are getting killed, you know? It's what? seen was sounds and over, you know? What kind of lad was he? How was your night going, lad? Full of mischief. As the bodies were removed from the bookmaker's shop this evening, Belfast was in a state of shock with fear of Republican retaliation and more deaths. Andrew Simmons, News at 10, in Belfast. Nearly 100 miles away on the border with the Republic, troops arrived to conduct a follow-up operation after yet another terrorist attack, but this time one that failed. An IRA gang had lured an off-duty UDR soldier who acted as a local dog warden to this isolated house near Belik in County Fermanagh so they could murder him. But the plan went wrong. In a gun battle, the soldier, though wounded, managed to see off his attackers, killing one while the others fled over the border. Two were later captured. At the same time in Belfast, 
new flowers arrived at Sinn Féin's advice centre in the Falls Road. The scene yesterday where a distraught RUC officer shot dead three men. The widow of one of them today spoke of her grief. He was just innocent. Just for me and the kids. That's all he was for. Me and the kids. And the first of the funerals took place for taxi driver Paddy Clark, shot dead by the UFF on Sunday. Mourners heard the city's Roman Catholic bishop, Dr. Patrick Walsh, describe how Belfast was shrouded in gloom, death, and near despair. In Dungannon, another funeral for another victim, bakery worker Gordon Hamill, who was killed by the IRA on Monday. By the end of the week, ten more funerals will be held, and no one believes the killing has stopped. Jim Buchanan, News at 10, Northern Ireland. Tonight, the Northern Ireland Secretary, Mr Peter Brook, described the killings as a slaughter. He said it was critically important for the people of Northern Ireland to keep their nerve. Uh, it is, of course, uh, beyond the pale to suggest, as the paramilitaries have suggested in their message in the aftermath of this afternoon, that the killing of men in a bookie's shop in Belfast uh, is in, in, in any way a parallel to events which occurred uh, in County Tyrone a fortnight ago. These matters cannot be balanced, and as I said myself in Northern Ireland only this morning, there are no such things as legitimate targets. In our Belfast studio now is Archbishop Robert Eames, the Primate of All Ireland. Archbishop, one hears so many calls from the church these days for reconciliation, but the killing never stops. Hasn't the church been effectively sidelined in this violence? I think if the church ever ceases to make its voice heard in those terms, we will have given up the struggle, because the struggle here is for the hearts and minds of people. And when you watch those pictures that the viewers have just seen of the, of the catastrophic and tragic events of today, we've got to spell it out that until people are prepared to give up those who are doing these things to, to make it known who they are and to, to put them out of their communities, we're going to go on burying the dead as I had to today. We've got to come to a point where people realize that there's nothing going to be gained by this. That but Archbishop, you have, you have made these calls before and nothing happens. The killing goes on. We have constantly made these calls and we have constantly worked for reconciliation. And it would be very wrong to give the impression that in the darkness of a frightened evening like this, that there isn't a great deal of good going on behind the smoke screen of all this. A lot of people are showing great courage and reaching out to each other across the divide. Those are the news stories that the world doesn't hear. Archbishop. I accept all that's happening, but we've got to keep our faith. Archbishop, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Julian. Liberal Democrat MPs tonight cheered in support of their leader, Mr Paddy Ashdown, at a meeting at the Commons. This morning, Mr Ashdown admitted having a brief relationship with a woman who was his secretary more than five years ago before he was party leader. Mr Ashdown made a statement after a Scottish newspaper referred to private papers about him which had been stolen from his solicitor's safe last month. It had been an extremely painful experience, he said, but one which his wife, Jane, and their family had faced with him. Mr. Major and Mr. Kinnock both said the matter should not be made a political issue. Paddy Ashdown was given many public displays of support today, but none was more important than the one which came from his wife, Jane, who told waiting reporters, we've been happy for 30 years. 30 more years? <laughs> and more than that. Thank you very much indeed. I'll be Bye -bye. happy. I've been very old, my <laughs> At party headquarters, the phone calls were said to be nearly all in his favour. There were even some, said officials, who phoned to join the party out of sympathy for Mr. Ashdown. And in the comments tonight, his party MPs cheered as he arrived to meet them and to say sorry. His job as leader is not under threat. There's a determination generally both uh, to give Paddy all the support we can and at the same time, as we've been doing uh, with this evening's normal weekly meeting of the MPs, to get back to business. So calling the media to the Jubilee Room in the Commons to hear the whole story seems to have paid off. Even as those journalists waited for a press conference which should have started at 11, Mr Ashdown was taking the first call of support from John Major. And though this was, in his words, a very painful experience, it has certainly limited the damage. 
He explained first why he'd given up his struggle to keep this story from the public. However, it is now clear to me that in this pre-election atmosphere, my family, my friends, my party colleagues and I will not be left alone and I have therefore decided to make this personal statement. It is my view that this brief relationship of five years ago is and always should have remained a private and personal matter of concern only to those involved. This has been, as you might guess, an extremely painful experience, but it is one which all involved, and especially my wife Jane and my family and I, have faced together. While I'm more than happy to answer any and all questions relating to my public duties and my capacity to do my job, I regret that I'll have nothing further to say uh, as to my private and personal life. I now intend to get back to work. The statement will now be issued to you, and if you'll forgive me, I now need to get back to the real job in hand, which is being leader of my party. Thank you very much. Mr. Ashdown would answer no questions, but a solicitor explained the decision to go public was made partly because the injunction wasn't working, partly because of the media harassment suffered by his family. A letter handed out in the media scrum also explained how details of the affair between Mr. Ashdown and his secretary were in a confidential memo stolen from a safe when the solicitor's office was burgled. Mr. Ashdown kept his silence, but his political opponents were ready to speak up on his behalf. I don't think this has uh, any relevance to Mr. Ashdown's policies or his capabilities. I don't believe it is a political issue. These matters are Mr. Ashdown's uh, personal affairs and the affairs of his family. They're not relevant to the political issues facing the country today, and they will play no part in our campaign uh, to win the next general election. So no one here is trying to make political capital out of Paddy Ashdown's personal problems and no party wants to see the campaign degenerate into a series of such revelations. But the election is a long way off yet and today's episode is unlikely to be the last of its kind. Peter Allen, News at 10, Westminster. Police have confirmed that they're investigating the break-in at the offices of Mr Ashdown's solicitors in the City of London. The missing papers consisted of notes made by his lawyer in May 1990 after Mr. Ashdown had told him about the affair. The solicitor, Mr. Andrew Phillips, said only he and his secretary knew about the document, and he added that the burglary had been a one-in-a-million freak chance. Outside Paddy Ashdown's solicitor's office today, questions about the burglary that provoked the scandal. Was it dirty tricks or just pure coincidence? Pure fluke. Break in. They break into one of the safes, took cash, and took a small number of documents. Partners here said the theft was the work of professionals who simply stumbled on a document and then realized they could cash in on it. Police are still investigating the break-in and gave no comment today. But the editor whose newspaper was offered the notes for sale isn't so sure the burglars simply got lucky. I think that the thought that this is a chance burglar who just happens to walk past this office and is able to uh, take this document from a safe, I think, uh, I just don't believe that. Mr. Ashdown's five-month affair with Patricia Howard started in 1986 at a time when she was separated from her husband. In May 1990, Mr. Ashdown told his solicitors about the affair in case it featured in the woman's divorce at the time. Records of the meeting were placed in the solicitor's safe. Those documents remained secure until three weeks ago when the offices were burgled. By the 28th, the News of the World had been offered the original document for £30,000. Two days later, Mr. Ashdown sought an injunction against publication. That injunction lasted until this morning. Then, while the Mirror's headline screamed of a hushed-up scandal, the Scotsman, not covered by an injunction under English law, went further, forcing Mr. Ashdown to go public about the affair he'd have liked to have kept private. I think there's a moral obligation not to delve into a politician's private life, which seems to me entirely irrelevant. However, the fact of the injunction, the uh, attempt to uh, suppress discussion of the thing, did seem to me to be something that uh, ought to be reported and was part of the whole uh, political currency at the moment leading up to the general election. By noon the injunction had been lifted. By nightfall the presses were rolling. Journalists able to cover the story fully and examine the extraordinary circumstances in which it had come to light. Many of Paddy Ashdown's colleagues at Westminster feel he and his wife Jane have had their privacy invaded and that the press has behaved badly. I think there is a serious risk in this country 
that we go down the American road where nobody will offer themselves for public office if it's going to be thought that their past life is going to be dredged over uh, through the sewage. It's, it's, it's intolerable that this happens. The comparison with America is timely. Last week, the Democrats' best hope for the presidency, Bill Clinton, publicly denied he'd had an affair with a cabaret singer. And four years ago, the Democrats' front-runner, Gary Hart, was destroyed by details of his affair. But the problem for both these men became whether or not they were telling the truth. In Britain, too, scandal has cost ministers their careers, but often, as in John Profumo's case, the original affair was compounded by the cover-up. He lied to the Commons about it. More recently, Mrs Thatcher, despite espousing Victorian values, tried and failed to keep Cecil Parkinson when the news that his secretary was pregnant became public. But Mr Ashdown's case is different and he's moved quickly to defuse a scandal by his statement. Many think he had a right to keep this out of the newspapers. The former chairman of the press council believes the press has gone too far and it's time people should get court protection to stop intrusion. In the case of a politician, the area of protection for their private lives is not as great as it would be for those who have no activity in the public domain. But there still is a right to uh, privacy for a, an MP. As I think this is a clear case of an unwarranted invasion. Uh, I think it's unhealthy if we come to a society in which certain secrets uh, about politicians are known to the press and politicians to the magic circle of the, the gin and tonic classes in central London, but not to the rest of the country. So it's always better that the people know things rather than don't. What's more important for the Liberal Democrats is how this affects voters. Mr Ashdown's own constituency, Yeovil, there was strong support. Oh. I can't believe that of Paddy, never. Will this make any difference to how you vote the next time? No, it won't make any difference at all. I think it's his own private business. The experts think it won't harm him in the polls. He'll lose some uh, votes among older people, possibly gain some with younger people. Uh, he may lose a few votes with women, gain a few with men. The net effect is going to be nil, in my view. Tonight, the Prime Minister's office said he retained an open mind on the subject of a Privacy Act. The government in the past, like the Labour Party, has said it's been prepared to give the press one last chance. But despite today's events, MPs from all sides of the House remain reluctant to embark on such a course. They know how difficult it would be to frame a reasonable and workable privacy law. Joe Andrews, News at 10, Westminster. Well, calls have been coming into Mr. Ashdown's party office in Yeovil since his statement. Mr. Ashdown's agent, Mr. Simon Thompson, has been talking to constituents and he joins us now from Yeovil. Mr. Thompson, what has been the mature reaction now that they've had a chance to take it in? Well, Julia, the recent calls I've taken from constituents have, have been ones of anger about the way in which Paddy's private life has been brought out into the open. I mean, we've got to remember here that there was a burglary involved and if that hadn't taken place, then this wouldn't have come out. And, of course, the fact that a newspaper, a national newspaper, was prepared to pay a considerable sum of money to publish the story. So, in other words, it's had a, an, an effect of consolidating support for him? Very much so, yes. Uh, I think uh, ranks have certainly closed, and uh, we've, we've actually signed up one or two new members uh, today, and we've received some donations and many pledges of support from people that we wouldn't have expected it from. Do you think he's the sort of man who's going to be able to put this behind him now? He's a tough politician, and I think he will do. Uh, it'll obviously take two or three days for the situation to die down a bit, but I think he will want get, to get back onto the campaign trail. We've, we've done a lot of preparation for the general election campaign. He's turned the party's fortunes around in the last year or so, and I think we're uh, going to get over this problem and get back to politics as soon as possible. Simon Thompson, thank you very much. Thank you. Our political editor, Michael Brunson, has spent the day listening to the reactions of MPs and party officials at Westminster. Michael, it's been a most extraordinary day. What are people making of it down there tonight? Well, I've talked to a lot of MPs uh, around Westminster, and while some of them privately are contrasting what's happened with the high moral tone that Paddy Ashdown often takes when he's dealing with political matters in the House of Commons, on all sides, I think, among MPs, there is the realisation that uh, they're not going to make political capital out of what's happened. Michael, can it really be a coincidence, this break-in at the offices of Mr Ashdown's solicitors? Well, I think the Liberal Democrats are accepting that it was probably a chance break-in. 
But there is a lot of worry tonight about this whole business of, of the break-ins. Um, the, the Tories have now come up, the Conservatives have come up with a list of no less than 39 incidents in all over the past couple of years, 11 of those involving computers. And tonight I've spoken, for example, to Sir James Hill, who's the member for Southampton Test. Now, he confirms to me, for example, that a telephone listening bug was fixed to the side of the filing cabinet in his agent's office. On the other hand, the Labour Party have come up tonight with, with fresh evidence of what's going on. Uh, Miss Mo Molam, who is the front bench Labour person who deals with the city, uh, she confirms that her computer has been tampered with, obviously sensitive with contacts between Labour and the city. And Labour is so worried that they're going to have a full security sweep, I understand, which could involve a sweep for, for bugs down on their Walworth Road headquarters. Michael, I'm sorry, we must stop it there. Thank you very much indeed. Britain says it will fight for cheaper airfares when it takes over the European presidency in five months' time. Will BA be flying into greater competition? We have a report next. Plus, Labour accused the government of NHS cover-up. And can Keegan, the manager, rekindle the magic of his playing days? That's in a couple of minutes. Mm, takes a lot to get me out of a warm bed. With so much equipment as standard, no wonder the 1992 Escort LX is a car you can get attached to. MNG 6K PEP. Oh, I see. MNG 6K PEP. Ah. MNG 6K PEP. MNG 6K PEP. You too. Okay. PS ASAP. Vegetables from now on, Gran. My body's a shrine. Nonsense, dear. You look lovely. I mean, I'm a vegetarian. Oh, that's nice. It's not nice. It's a serious commitment. Sounds like an excuse to eat your mother's vegetable moussaka. Yes. I hope you're enjoying my Weight Watchers moussaka. Yes, Mum. But I'm not eating it because I enjoy it. Strange child. Vegetable moussaka. From Weight Watchers, from Heinz. The world is just one giant package full of millions of little packages. Get an eye full of these. All looking for somewhere to go. Sydney, not you, the place. Now when you have a desperately important parcel, no matter how big or how small, you'd better shape up, honey, by calling DHL. Ain't no mountain high enough. DHL, you know it's arrived the moment it's sent. Cripes, that was quick. You're welcome, Sydney. In the face of fearsome competition, information technology can be a very powerful weapon. Anderson Consulting can help you find the best way to unleash it. to have someone you can trust to turn to. That's why Ford are working together with their dealers on new programs of training, service, and care to keep you on the road. Ford, it may be your car, but it's still our baby. has promised to push for cheaper airfares throughout Europe when it takes over the EC presidency in five months' time. Ministers see deregulation and more competition as the key to improving services for air travellers. Despite frequent calls from passengers for cheaper airfares, state-owned airlines have faced little effective competition. And while the major European airports are operating near maximum capacity, 
there's limited opportunity, the independents say, for them to offer a cheaper alternative. For all the major routes in Europe, with a few exceptions, that you have two airlines operating, one from either end of the route. And I think it uh, is abundantly clear that uh, it is in the interest of those two flag carrier state-owned airlines to keep the airfares as high as possible. On the face of it, European airfares don't compare favourably. One return budget fare to New York currently costs £209. A similar return to Strasbourg, home of the European Parliament, is £360. And a budget return to Rome is £370. British Airways says it welcomes the prospect of deregulation and denies that its overwhelming domination of the domestic market means there's no real competition here. We face more competition than any of our principal competitors in Europe, probably more competition than any of the principal airlines in the world. The government opened up Heathrow, all the carriers that wanted to come to Heathrow have successfully come there, and we are happy to compete against them. Its critics disagree. We always find, of course, when another airline comes on a European route, British Airways find, miraculously, that they're able to charge less. Suddenly, their fares come down as well. Air industry analysts say deregulation in the States proved a mixed blessing. It did increase choice, but...